Welcome, welcome, welcome. So good, so good to see each one of you. Um, thank you, firstly, for trusting us with this journey, uh, for being with us uh, this evening and hopefully the next two uh, weekends as well, next two Saturdays as well. Uh, just want to, um, you know, welcome every one of you and, you know, we'll open in prayer and then we'll just, um, you know, give you a little bit of a background of what to expect, uh, what we are doing here, why we do this, uh, you know, uh, what God has asked us to do and how this all connects with each of our homes and families. And then we'll go on to the session. Yeah, we'll just open in prayer. I'll just open. Um, my request to everyone is try and keep your videos on. I know some of you are requested uh, to keep the videos off either because of connection or because of toddlers jumping about, which of course we said is absolutely fine by us. But um, yeah, it would be wonderful if we can see your faces um, and not black boxes um, as much as possible. Uh, but keep your audios off because that will just help with the uh, with the clarity of, of uh, you know, the broadcast or whatever. So um, yeah, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful evening, Father God. Thank you that you had ordained this time even before time, Lord, even before the foundations of the world, Father God. You had set us apart. You had chosen each one of us as father and mother, Lord, as parents, Lord. And some of us even parents to be, Father God. Oh, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your great love, Father God. We thank you that you are a perfect parent, Lord. You are El Shaddai, you are almighty and all sufficient one, Father God. And I speak your sufficiency in parenting, Lord, into every parent present here, Father God. Yes, Abba, we ask, Lord, I pray your sufficiency, Lord, your sufficiency over every father present here, Lord, over every mother present here, Father God. We thank you that you have chosen us, Lord. You have chosen us, Father God, to be parents to our children. What an honor, what a privilege, Father Father God. Forgive us, Lord, when we, when we don't see it that way at times. Forgive us, Lord, when we get tired and weary, Father God, when we forget to come to you and drink of you, Father God. Oh, Lord God, we thank you. I just want to bless every parent that is present here, even the ones that are uh, on the way in, Lord. I pray, God, for each home that is represented here, Father God. You know everybody's heart, Father. You know the deepest thoughts of their heart. You know the deepest desires of our Father. And we confess, Lord, we cannot do this without you, Father. We cannot do anything without you, Lord. So we ask, Father, for your wisdom, for your strength, Abba, Father. Even as each one of us humble ourselves, Father God, every father and every mother, teach our hearts to hum be humble before you, Father God. And you will fill us with your grace, Father God, because your word says that you give grace to the humble, Lord. So we ask, Lord, for fathering grace and mothering grace to be released in this place as we humble ourselves lord we thank you once again for this time we pray god that every connection will be smooth father god we pray god for the ones that have babies and toddlers that you will keep them uh, safe that you will keep them calm during this time father god we pray god that um any disturbance anything even in our own minds father god you will remove father god and pour in a fresh anointing of your spirit that will lead us and guide us that will soften our hearts father God, to receive all that you have for us. Lord, we're not here to listen to men, Lord. We're here to listen to your voice, Father God. And as, as we have registered and come here, Lord, this is our little, little, um, little five loaves and two fish that you are putting in here, Father God. I pray, God, that the little faith that we have come with, Father God, that you will partner with that, Father God, and you will move every mountain, Father God, in our homes, Father, in our relationships, especially with our children, Father. Father God, with our teenagers, Father God, with our, with our toddlers, maybe, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you are interested, Abba, Father. You are interested in every detail of our lives, Father God. You're not a God that is busy. You're not a God that is distracted. You're not a God that sleeps or slumbers, Father God. So we thank you that you are attentive to your people. You are attentive to your people, Father God. So you have your way in this place, Abba. You have your way, Yahweh. We surrender ourselves. We commit, Lord Manoj and myself, we humble ourselves to you, Abba Father. We may have done this many times before, Father God, but we ask, Lord, 
for your word to speak through us, Father God, not a word more, not a word less. Lord, Holy Spirit, you lead and guide this, this entire meeting, Father God. Cover it with your precious blood. Cover it with your precious blood. Cover it with your holy fire, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah. See, this is the time when, you know, if we were all in one room, I could have heard a, a loud resonating amen. And this is what I don't like about the online thing, right? I mean, uh, it would be so good to have all of you, all of us in one room, but I'm thankful for this because we have, um, we have people from all over India and even uh, other nations, which is so, so, uh, so humbling and so beautiful. Um, so I'm just going to start with, um, uh, you know, a little bit about the introduction, what we're doing. So we we uh, have a ministry called Mustard Ministries. For those of you who don't, who don't know, I think half of you, are probably a little more than half maybe already know. Um, uh, so we have a ministry. Uh, and as we started, it's a cafe ministry. We started with having one part as, uh, you know, a cafe for evangelism. Uh, but the ministry side of things, God started unfolding everything to do with family. Um, you know, so we started with youth. We have a lady group then we have a men's group and all this didn't start boom one day you know it evolved over years and and what we learned through all that is God just unfolded it was almost like the you know at the end of it or at the middle of it when we look back it was like oh it was family all along it was homes all along because to be honest if we can sort out our marriages if we can sort out our families then, then our churches will be power packed. Then our cities will be transformed. Then our nations will know Jesus. Do you agree? So, so it's all about the families, right? It's all about the homes. And, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. We started with, uh, you know, with the ladies telling me stories about, we don't know, you know, th these would be ladies who are entrepreneurs or, you know, just housewives. They might be having their fourth child. Um, you know, the first one they did well, second one they did okay, third one, they're still, all, you know, figuring out. But the fourth one, they're crying because they're just like, I don't know what to do with this one. You know, so we had all kinds of stories coming to us and we were like, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. But I remember the one story, one, and it's not a story. When I say story, it's all real, real life, um, you know, situations I'm talking about. There was one thing that's, that, that, you know, a mother spoke to me about that really snapped inside of me saying, we've got to do something. You know, this is not based on, do we have the time? Do we have the resources? This is based on God asking us to do something. Because many people in the Bible, when God asked them to do something, they didn't really have the skill or the resources, right? All they needed to do is trust God and, and be obedient to God. And then God did everything else. And that's that's our story too. Um, so this, I just wanna say the story just to set the stage um, that parenting is, is serious business, right? Parenting is serious business. And I think all of us here might be from different backgrounds, different cultures, uh, different stages of parenting. Some of us may be just starting. Some of us may be okay. Uh, some of us are frustrated. Some of us are like at the end of our rope, right? We might be big guys in our workplaces, but this is one place where we're like, Lord, help me. I don't even know what to do. I don't know how I can get my teenager, whether it's a, a girl or a boy, to, to just look at me, let alone listen to me or obey me, right? So whatever it is, whatever stage of, of parenting we are at, uh, what you have done by just being present here, God honors that. It's your step to say, Lord, help me. You know, and many times uh, parents, you know, come for these uh, workshops saying, okay, tell us, what do we need to tell our teens? What do we need to do with our teens? You know, that's the, that's the angle with which we come. But the angle with which we go is that we have a lot of things to do as parents. So please be, uh, you know, ready. And like I prayed, let's humble ourselves before God so that he pours in the grace because it's all him. Right, it's all his wisdom. So I'm going to go back to that one quick story. Um, this parent was talking to me, a, a, a mother, and she was telling me about another friend, mother of uh, of hers, uh, their daughter, who was um, nine years old at the time, um, uh, was was uh, sharing with you know this this mother, this person who was talking to me. She was the Sunday school teacher. Um, and uh, she shared with her that she was struggling with pornography for the last two years. 
uh, right? And the story has a longer part of it, but I'm just gonna say that little bit, a nine-year-old speaking to her Sunday school teacher who happens to be the friend of her mother, uh, right? Because her personality was changing, the chirpy little girl had become very quiet, uh, very withdrawn, um, and she was the only daughter to, to her parents. Um, so this Sunday school teacher just kept probing, just kept nudging, what's happening? You know, after, after class, she just asked an extra question, and then she just, she just blurted this out and said, Auntie, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm watching this. And then, of course, the Sunday school teacher asked, how come? How do you have access? And, you know, she explained, you know, mom is busy. She's at, she's at work. Dad works from home. I have my computer. It just popped up one day. And so how long has this been happening? Almost two years, since seven years old. I, I, I didn't know the word, I think, till I was 20 and beyond. I don't even know when, but I don't think I knew the meaning of that. But the reason I'm saying this is this is real for our children, right? Uh, this is not to put anyone down. If any of you are going through anything like this, uh, I'm not pulling this out because of that. I'm just saying that this is serious business. And if we don't, as parents, um, understand the importance of parenting, if you're just saying that, okay, we have children, so we've got to take care of them. We've got to, we've got to do this anyway. So just, just let's be done with it. Uh, that can't be the attitude. And I'm sure that's not the attitude of any of you. And that's why you are here, right? So this is serious business. Uh, thankfully, we're not really here to say 10 steps to great parenting because there is nothing like that. There is only one step and that is how to hear God's voice and how we can be led by the Holy Spirit to, to parent our children that God has given us, that God has created in a manner that is pleasing to him so that they can step into their God-given destinies, right? That's, that's the whole point. What we will be sharing is, yes, from our experience, from what we have ourselves experienced as parents, from what we have seen, uh, you know, walking with other parents, walking with teens, uh, you know, for so many years or some years, um, uh, those are the things that we're going to share and hopefully we're going to share with each other and we'll know that we're not alone uh, right we are we are together in this in in this journey and god is going to do what he has to do we've already been praying for this workshop and we truly believe that it's 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 going to flip if any of us think that okay this is just one more thing i'm going to try you know um or if it's just it's the first time i'm doing this whatever it is we believe that god is here to just you know divinely flip whatever it is need, that needs flipping. That's one word I got. In fact, I was sharing it with a friend yesterday that it's going to be a divine flip. It's going to be a divine flip in our parenting. When I say flip, it's going to come right side up. Nothing's anything. If there's anything upside down in our homes, it's going to come right side up. All we need to do is partner with God. All we need to do is say, Lord, I've got this little teeny weeny bit of faith teeny weeny with a faith and that's all God wants right so all set are we all set you know some of you uh, some of you have this yes I am I, I, I you know and, and the others are like oh my goodness where have I come <laughs> so no no I, I have these little jokes that uh, you know keeps uh, coming in between so please don't take offense I am like this a little loud when my husband starts speaking for those of you who have softer ears you will you will enjoy it in case i'm a bit too loud but yeah i'm gonna hand it um over to uh, sorry before that um you know normally we we ask everyone to introduce uh, each of you just that when we have parenting workshops we normally i think the maximum we've done is probably 18 people and today um i think we you know there are 39 showing on the screen but i think some of you are fathers and mothers together so i think we have about 50 plus uh in the room so if we introduce ourselves i think we will only be introducing ourselves um so we will not be uh, able to get everyone to say who you are and you know what you've come here with in terms of an expectation uh, but just again to give us uh, uh, you know an idea of um, uh, you know what to expect and where are your hearts and what is your expectation uh, it would really help and i'm sure it'll help the rest of us as well we have about 15 minutes uh, set aside for this um and I'm going to ask the more, um, you know, uh, bolder ones to not waste time and unmute yourself and uh, just quickly introduce yourself, maybe say something about your children or teens, if you'd like. And what do you expect 
from these three weekends, you know, uh, in more words. So may I ask anyone to um, start? Hi, Nancy. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Uh, I think for me, um, Shriza is just turning 13, so she'll be entering teenage life this year. So I think for me, it's just preparation. It's just to equip myself to know what to expect. Uh, I know there's tons of stuff online, but it's good to kind of get the godly direction before I go and do my own research. So just preparing for uh, the years to come. That's that's my uh, goal for this workshop. Great, great. Preparing. Oh, that's wonderful. I wish, I wish, uh, you know, a lot of parents would be saying, I wish I had that. I wish somebody told me this <laughs> before, you know, my kids are 16 and 20. But wonderful. Thanks, Chris. Anyone else? Anyone, come on. Yes, Sumati here from Bangalore. Uh, me and Ramesh, uh, we are together. Ramesh will just come back. And uh, we have three children, Joshua, Rachel, and Sam, 22, 20, and uh, 12 years old. Uh, we have done lots of mistakes. Uh, we are uh, correcting now. But uh, to have a perspective of, uh, collective perspective of becoming a better parent is uh, our uh, idea that is not just to be a better parent but a godly parent wonderful yes not just to be a better parent but a godly parent absolutely very very key thanks thanks Sumati. who else come on come on uh, hi uh, this is hi lindsay hey manoj this is nesta um uh, anya just turned uh, 13 last month and uh, i think uh, for me that the quest is to learn in my life is to learn how to walk in fear of the Lord and to learn to bring my daughter up in the fear of the, to grow up in the fear of the Lord in a time when, you know, uh, praise and boldness and rebellion is considered a positive attribute. Yes, yeah, so, so, so the, so the biblical way of uh, being a parent. Yes, yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah, rebellion. Oh, my goodness. Key word these days. Great. Thanks, Nesta. Who else? Hi, this is Febu and Lisa here. Um, we've got four kids. It's five, seven, nine, and 11. So it's not just one that we have to um, bring up. So I thought coming here would be a good idea to learn because there's going to be a lot to do. So <laughs> yeah, so that's us. Wow, great, great. Great to have you here, Febu and Lisa. Yeah, four kids, my goodness. Hats off to you with just the four, the number four. Oh, gosh, that, there's only that much mind space we all have, right? So it's amazing, but I'm sure you guys have a, uh, what is the word, quadruple portion. So great. Who else? Hi, uh, Milo and Mala here. Yes. And uh, we are uh, attending from Delhi. And uh, we, we two have four children. I have uh, three daughters, one son, and uh, two of my daughters are now teen. One is uh, 19 years, giving her 12th board. Another is 16 years, giving her 10th board. Whoa. So when I got this seminar news, I felt uh, it will be very uh, uh, helpful for us to, because I see some changes in my children, mm. which I feel it's not like before when they were child. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even a little confused also sometimes dealing with the issues. So I felt this, I think this is the right platform where I will get some guidance, right. godly guidance uh, for parenting. Great, great. Thanks, Milo, for Thank sharing. You. Great to have you, Milo and Mala from Delhi. Um, who else? It's already giving us some encouragement. Yes, hopefully we'll hold them. This is Carolyn and John. We have three boys, uh, 22, about 21 and 14. Right. Uh, but the same parenting style doesn't seem to work with our third. 
and uh, we want to be good stewards and raise them up you know to be godly children so we are here to learn you know how we can i know they are god's children before they are ours but yeah how can we be responsible parents yes wonderful wonderful yeah gosh we hear that all the time this is not working with that that is not working with this i'm sure god says the same thing about us no between the father and the mother you know this doesn't work with manoj that doesn't work with lindsay because we are so uniquely fearfully and wonderfully made right so yeah it's the same with our children wonderful anyone else this is uh lena here and lloyd is also on the call uh we decided to connect on two different devices just to be able to hear and participate more fully uh we are in the middle east i'm so glad that we could join we want to learn all as i mean as much as we can because we realize that this is a new phase teenage is a new phase and it's not like it has been before so we've been very compliant before and now uh you know they are developing to be their own personality and so uh, we want her to love the lord and be as um you know fulfill her purpose as a um as has whom god has created her to be and and to aid that process and not try to make her a mini lena or a mini lloyd so um we hope this will be a blessing right wonderful 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 yeah mini lena mini lloyd very very key it will come up when we uh, go through the sessions you know we Uh, it's like deja vu when I mean, we we try and not do we like we will not do this you know when we think of our parents like that is something i will just not do i don't know how they do this and then whoa we do exactly the same thing but uh, yeah god is so gracious who else hello lindsay and manoj uh, pastor manoj uh, this is sheba and uh, richard here uh, we have two children one is uh, 17 years and other is 5 uh, years so they are in two different stages of life <laughs> so we don't want to do any trial and error method so, so this was the right uh, you know uh, workshop for us at the right time actually we were actually going through a lot of uh, kind of uh, stress <laughs> regarding uh, our teenager but uh, yeah god has his own plans at the right time so we are here uh, with a lot of expectations and uh, i'm definitely sure god is going to answer our every uh, prayer and he's going to guide us in the right direction and we want our children in a in a to grow in, to grow in the godly uh, platform and uh, yeah be the <clears throat> children of the kingdom you know? and uh, today uh, there's a lot of pressure with the teens outside world mm-hmm. and uh, when you want to minister them uh, the way uh, with our faith it mm-hmm. becomes a big challenge uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, especially with the teens uh, it it's quite a challenge uh, the and peer pressure is more uh, attracting the world and uh, uh, when we try to correct with the word it becomes sometime like okay only uh, you want to talk about uh, uh, you know our faith and uh, yes so it becomes a challenge yes <clears throat> yeah. yeah definitely yeah thank so you so fast. much for thinking of this uh, you know yeah. Yeah. thing we were actually really wanting uh, you know kind of guidance and counseling <laughs> regarding this and it's uh, thank you so much no praise god praise god this is really i mean one thing i just uh, you know we we have a few more minutes is there anyone else who wants to um, share expectation maybe we can have one more person share and then get on anyone hi this is uh, isaac and uh, my wife esther is here we have a 16 Hello. month old so mm-hmm. from being a baby she is uh, uh, turned out to be a small human being with feelings and all of it so <laughs> deal with all her feelings uh, sometimes me and esther we joke uh, saying that uh, god couldn't handle her in heaven so she sent her sent her down to earth to us so want <laughs> to get prepared for what is uh, ahead of us Uh, we know this uh, session these sessions are going to be a blessing to us and uh, thank you to manoj and lindsay for hosting this yes yes we hear you thanks isaac and esther for sharing yeah she's still a teen yeah you said 16 months right so oh yes <laughs> so teen is there but i'm so glad i'm so glad it is a blessing indeed if uh, you know if we can be taught 
early you know why not you know you might have to do it a few times we have uh, uh, we have done this many times before and uh, we have some people who refuse to um, not attend whenever we have like tina and amrit um, uh, you know they are they are always here not because of anything else because they also have four children so they like okay we've got to do this over and over and over again because we tend to uh, forget but so good to have uh, you know some of you back with us uh, so good to have you um, you know some of you for the first time um, but i just want to set the stage uh, also about the age uh, you know that we call teen uh, you know uh, even even um, research like outside research not even you know christian research biblically uh, but outside research if you go to any platforms if you take any books in fact alpha courses is one of the courses that we started using for parenting um courses that we have done through mustard and even in the alpha course uh, the teen the age teen starts they say from 11 not even from 13 they say from 11 you know because the research shows uh, that children uh, you know have 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 been showing behaviors of a teenager from the age of 11 and this this was uh, this was some 6 7 maybe years ago uh, and i i truly believe it at least the little experience that we have we've actually been seeing teen behaviors in in you know from the age of 8 9 nowadays uh, so sometimes we tell parents you know what you don't you don't need to wait for 13 um, you can actually get them into the teen session or get them into or you can come for the parenting session so uh, i just wanted to share that uh, that bit of information and i'm going to ask uh, manoj to just uh, take us through uh, you know the overall um, uh, session what we're going to do and how how it's all going to tie in and then we go to the session 1 so for just this uh, first part i'm going to share my screen Can everyone um, see it? Can I have? Yeah, I can see a thumbs up. Okay, over to Manoj. Uh, okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, so good to have you here. Um, and it really is a privilege for us um, getting to meet all of you. Uh, all those just three weekends, but uh, we do believe we establish some new connections, and it's good to see some old faces on on this forum. It's always good. Um, um uh, but like lindsay shared i just want to build on that um the aim and the objective of these kind of forums is not to present uh a template that you and i can go away and then just uh you know easily apply i'm sure you'll all agree that um uh, teenage years are not easy there is a transition in progress and uh, many times uh it takes years to figure out uh what our teens are going through especially when they are at the cusp when they're just becoming adolescent uh and there are hormonal changes and so on and so forth peer pressure um we we all know what we are talking about so um at the outset i would just like to uh encourage each of us to be patient um and uh, believe that our teens are listening to us uh even if you have to encounter rebellion from time to time and uh, shut doors and stomping feet uh that's all part of those teenage years but uh, i just want to encourage each parent um doesn't matter what age your teen is uh, to be patient with them they are listening whatever you are saying is being deposited in them uh and with that i just want to go over to the first slide just to set uh the stage for what we are talking about so part 1 uh in fact this today and next week um in fact today we will be doing two sessions the first one is called keeping the end in mind and uh where we will be talking about a little bit about the transition uh that a child goes through uh when adolescence kicks in and what what happens uh within a child and how parents can better uh relate to their children um so that's something that we'll be talking about it's called keeping the end in mind um we also touch upon how important it is to keep a long term view in mind um and here is something that we have noticed even with our own teen at home it's very easy to see them for the children that they are uh, like one of the parents said i'm noticing certain things that 
uh, are changing and they were not like the way they were when they were children. Now, you're spot on um, because that, that happens with all teens. Um, so I think that will give you some comfort that you're not alone. Uh, so the first part, part one, we, uh, as understanding the transition, we're looking at, it's important to keep the end in mind, which means not to look at the teenager as he or she is today, but to look at and to start visualizing the adult or the person that he or she will become someday. Mm -hmm. And that is not something that you and I can control because we are just human end of the day. Uh, and that's, that's where the God factor comes into play. Um, so there are certain things that you and I are called to do. And as long as we stay faithful and obedient to that, uh, God enables us to do the rest. God does the rest. Uh, so keeping the end in mind, as you can see on that wheel, is the first section where we talk about uh, seeing the adult and not necessarily the teenager that you have before you. Um, the second part, we're looking at how we can better relate to them emotionally, how we can have certain relational connects with them. We can give you a few pointers based on what we've observed, especially from an Asian and Indian uh, parenting perspective. Uh, we may not have time to go into a lot of statistics. We don't believe in doing that, but something that's practical that you and I can take away and start to apply and then hopefully begin to see progress. So that's called meeting teenagers' needs. Um, third section, setting boundaries. Um, this is something that we are all challenged by. Uh, and while we share this, we are not perfect parents either. So don't ever think that we are perfect and we've, uh, uh, you know, we've got it all figured out. No, we are not perfect and we want you to know that. Uh, so we are sharing from a place where we've made our mistakes and we continue to make our mistakes. But as long as we have a heart that's open to learning, um, I believe God will enable us to move forward. So setting boundaries is very important. How do we set boundaries lovingly uh, without imposing on our children, without embittering them? Because that's what we will begin to see. Um, developing emotional health and then helping them to make good choices. Now, one thing I want us to notice, if you look at the wheel, <coughs> the rim of the wheel has something called modeling and uh, modeling values, which is very, very important. Um, more than what you and I as parents would tell our teenage children or children, they pick up what you and I model for them. Um, so you can imagine a wagon wheel. So the rim of the wheel is modeling of values. And right at the center is love. And that's very intentionally kept there because without love, you and I really don't get far. So everything, so love is the hub around which this entire wheel rotates. And the modeling of values is something that you and I, no matter how many times you have uh, modeled something for them and they've not picked it up, we want to encourage you to keep doing it because that is so, so important for you and for me. More than what we say, it's what we are actually revealing to them. So modeling values and at the center, the hub is love. And while we know it's challenging, as we progress through this uh, program, I believe that we will pick up certain helpful tips and you know practical ways of uh, you know dealing with our children and uh, you know being able to see the adults in the making. So that's that's something that you know uh, will help us. So the first section, keeping the end in mind, and I just want to speak a little bit about um, what happens. Um, with children, when we're dealing with little children, uh, maybe up to the age of seven, eight uh, onwards, and then we start seeing shifts in them. Uh, puberty sets in. In fact, with our own daughter, I mean, uh, it, it, uh, puberty set in probably by the age of 10, mm -hmm. nine, 10 onwards. And we began to see shifts in her behavior, very slight, but uh, we could see new streaks coming into her behavior. And uh, since we had already prepared ourselves through, you know, various such, uh, you know, training programs and, you know, above all, you know, God was helping us to put certain measures in place because we were anticipating it. Uh, because uh, statistics reveal that puberty, the age of puberty is actually dropping with each passing year. So what used to be 10, 11, 12, 13 and upwards is now dropping with each passing generation. So that's helpful for us to know, especially for those of us who have smaller children. Um, but here's the thing, um, as these children grow, as they become adolescent, like I mentioned, 
uh, puberty sets in, there are hormonal changes. Uh, there's something very important that happens in the brain of a teenager. Now the brain, the human brain has two parts to it. And this will be helpful for you and me to remember. Um, there are two parts in it. Uh, one is called the limbic system, which is located at the base of the brain. And the other one is called the prefrontal cortex, which is just located near the forehead. So the prefrontal cortex is at the, at, at the front and there's something called the limbic system, which is located at the base of the brain. Now, what happens is when a child becomes an adolescent and is going through adolescent years, the limbic system is the one that generates emotions. So in the human brain, limbic system is where emotions such as anger, fear, and all such strong emotions are being generated. So the limbic system is at the back. That's where all these strong emotions are being generated. And then the prefrontal cortex, which is located near the forehead, is something that in a teenager is on very low power mode, which means it is not developed. Now in an adult brain, both the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex is developed. So you can already begin to see an adult brain is fully developed, is able to process emotions of anger, fear, uh, excitement and all such things. But in a teenager, because the prefrontal cortex is not developed, they're not able to process, they're not able to make rational choices, especially when they have emotions. <clears throat> and there have been tests that have been conducted, research that has been conducted, where uh, when the adult brain is exposed to say fear, so they have an adult brain and they have a teenager's brain. And researchers have found out that when an adult brain and a teenager's brain is exposed to say fear, they respond very differently. So take the adult brain, when it is exposed to fear, there are connectors attached and the adult brain, both the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex, they light up, which means they are receiving the information and they're also processing it the right way. Now, the same exposure of fear, the teenager's brain, only the limbic system lights up. The prefrontal cortex is mostly dark, which means it's not developed. So hence, the way a teenager responds to fear or excitement or anger is very different to how an adult responds to fear or anger or any such strong emotion. And hence, there's a huge disconnect between what the adult seeks to achieve out of a particular situation and what a teenager hopes to achieve because they're not seeing it the way you and I see it. And that results in a lot of disagreements, a lot of disputes and parents coming and saying that, you know, my, my child just doesn't get it. I've, I've told him or her so many times, but they just don't seem to get it. Now, this is so helpful uh, when we begin to understand how God has created you and me. This is the human brain that we're talking about. Okay, so that's one part that I want us to keep in mind and we'll touch on this as we go forward. I think there's a short video also that will explain it. Now, between the age of three and eight, a child's brain has twice as many neurons as an adult. It has twice as many connectors or synapses as an adult brain. It has twice the energy of an adult brain. That explains why children can't seem to sit still. How many of us have that problem? Our children just don't be able to seem, seem to sit still. That's because they have twice the energy of an adult brain. And the challenge that you and I as parents face is what do I do with all this energy? I'm getting tired. I don't know what to do with my children. Now, we're all in the same boat. That's just the way God's created children. So we just need to be a little more sensitive to what is happening in that little child's brain, little teen's brain. So they have twice the energy that you and I may have as an adult. Now, when they enter adolescence, pay attention, this is very important. The human brain starts to experience a process called pruning. Okay? They start experiencing a process called pruning and here's the interesting thing. This is what research has discovered. 
when the adolescent or when the teen goes through this pruning process, only those connectors, synapses, only those that are reinforced by the parents positively through that child's personal experience, only those connectors are nourished and they grow. I'll say it again. When the child becomes an adolescent and enters into the teenage years, the brain goes through a process called pruning. And what happens in the pruning process? Only those connectors in the brain, the synapses, that are exposed and are positively reinforced by the parents and the environment in the home, only those connectors grow in a healthy way. What that means is those connectors that are exposed to negative experiences in the home, they don't grow, they actually atrophy. They don't grow. They, there's a reverse cycle in the brain. And hence, you have tantrums that the child cannot control. That is a response to the environment in the home. That rebellion is a response to the negative environment that is being built in the home. Now, this is very, very important for parents to understand. This is how God has created all of us. And the moment we start grasping it, we start paying attention to creating a wholesome environment in our own homes. That is an awesome privilege and a responsibility God has placed on you and me as parents. And when we look at that video, uh, you know, it will touch upon some of these aspects of how the human brain is constructed and the importance of exposing our children to wholesome, positive environments in the home. So say husband and wife have frequent disagreements. There are shouting matches between the husband and the wife. That's a negative experience that is being imparted to the child, to the teen. So what happens is that connector in the brain is basically not growing, it's being atrophied. It's being stunted, it doesn't grow. And from that follows the behavior and the actions of that teen. Okay, so that's the first part that I want us to uh, kind of grasp. We can take questions as we go through this evening, uh, but just a little bit about how God has created us, how the human brain functions. Uh, and if you didn't get any of the terms, that's fine. The video will make it a little more clear. Uh, and I think um, we can, yeah. Yeah, we'll just have uh, Tijan and Shino play the video. It's just a four and a half, five minute video. Um, Tijan? like caterpillars, are going through a process of transformation. The difference is that the teenager's transition is taking place in full view of others. There's no cocoon to hide them from sight. One of the major factors in all the changes is the impact of the rush of hormones. We'd like to think of human beings as being rational and human beings' behavior being driven by thoughts uh, and rules and things like that. In other words, the social factors should determine how our children behave. In fact, there's a whole landscape going on underneath. It's called hormones and it's called brain development. And it happens at different ages with different children. It also happens differently when you compare boys with girls. And these chemicals are like rocket fuel. They do have huge, a huge influence on the behavior of our children. Everything from emotional volatility to their sex drive, which many of us would rather not think about, uh, but it's all true. So hormones have to be respected as a major factor in child development and behavior. A sweet, enthusiastic child can turn into a difficult, argumentative, and sometimes angry teenager overnight. That's normal. And if it's your experience, you're not alone. They will grow through this stage. For many of us as parents, just knowing that helps us to go with it, to grow with them, to help them through this stage rather than holding our breath or giving up and just hoping for the best. For the average girl, puberty starts at around 11 to 12 years old, but can be earlier. And for the average boy, from 12 to 14 years old, but again, can happen sooner. 
The other area in which the brain is still developing has to do with reading emotions and understanding the emotional significance of things that are said. So when parents get really distressed, which they do, because it seems that their children don't care about the upset that they're causing, um, it's not because their children don't care. It's because their brains are not computing the fact that they are causing this distress to other people around them. Today, children are growing up so, so quickly, uh, and puberty is kicking in a lot earlier. One in six girls are starting puberty at the age of eight compared to one in 100 25 years ago. The boys have dropped down to 10. Now, when I say puberty, I mean just the basic simple changes before menstruation or, or before sort of the massive surge of puberty. But then you've got uh, the mental changes, the physical changes, the sexual changes and the emotional changes. And it's vast. The whole body is reorganizing itself. And for many teenagers, it's overwhelming. And for many parents, it's overwhelming. I use the analogy of a roller coaster. And many teenagers really identify with that. One minute you're up, next minute you're down. You don't quite understand what's happening to yourself and your body and your mind. Very, very, very confusing for everybody concerned. But their brains grow and develop and they do reach a point at which they suddenly appreciate all these things that they don't seem to appreciate in their early teenage years. A lot of their behavior during this stage can look like rebellion as they experiment, push for independence, voice their opinions or become very self-oriented and do the opposite of whatever we want them to. We used to think that uh, the brain was fully developed by, by, by late childhood. We always knew there was a burst of brain activity around toddlerhood, but what they discovered was there's a similar burst of brain growth around puberty. But whereas around toddlerhood, the brain growth was to do with balance and movement, around puberty, it's to do with emotion and memory. If being around your teenage daughter is like sitting at the foot of an emotional uh, volcano, you're not that far from the mark. If you've ever said to your teenager, you're behaving like a two-year-old, again, you're not that far from the mark. But the last bit to develop is at the prefrontal cortex here, and it's the bit of the brain that psychologists call the brain's policeman. Some call it the brakes. It's the bit of brain that gives you sound judgment. That bit of the brain is still developing. So we say, how can you think of skateboarding off a 20-foot high wall? Why don't you put your seatbelt on? That bit of the brain is still growing. It's the bit of the brain, for example, that allows you to defer immediate gratification for the sake of longer term good. We say, how can you think of going clubbing the night before your GCSE maths exam? Dad, the exam is not till tomorrow afternoon, for goodness sake. That bit of the brain is still developing. And that's why it's important to just get our teenagers through, just hang in there with them. They are literally a work in progress. The scary thing is one psychologist said, some teenagers don't get their breaks till they're 25 years old. And certainly that's true. Well, I hope that uh, didn't make a few of you fall off your chairs. Uh, 25 is not something that is uh, written in stone, but uh, it's good to understand how God has created each of us. Um, and what we want to do now is uh, just attempt that exercise that uh, you may have received uh, called building character. It's a set of simple questions. Uh, what are some characteristics you hope uh, that your teenager will develop eventually? Write them down if you can. Simple uh, honesty, self-control, uh, respect for authority, so on and so forth. And how can you help them as a parent? How can you help them? How can you develop the environment uh, so that they can start developing these characteristics uh, based on what you've just heard so far? Um, how can I not look at just the teenager before me, but how can I keep the adult? To give you five to seven minutes. Uh, it's a fairly simple exercise, but it's just to get the ball rolling. So uh, take those five, seven minutes to just note down few of your thoughts on a piece of paper. Everyone's got the got the questions, right? It, it was there in the group. So it's just two simple questions. What are the characteristics? Everyone's got that, right? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Yeah. So just take some time out. We're going to wait, uh, give you about five minutes and just put that down. It's always good to write things down. So just put that down and then we'll come back.
Are we done? We're doing okay? Yeah, some of us are done. I think we should give extra time to those who have four children, no? Okay, most of us, most of us, yeah, done. See, Lisa's done. So I'm gonna keep that as a as a mark. So if Lisa's done, then everybody finish time. That's it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is um, we will uh, discuss it at the end. We have a, about 20, 25 minutes kept for question and answer, uh, you know, after the session, just so that we can keep time. Uh, so maybe at that time, you know, some of you may want to share, some of you may want to ask questions. So hold on to that. What are the characters that you would want your team to have eventually, right? That's the question, eventually, right? So, uh, so and what can we as parents do uh, to build that or to, or to nurture that, to enable them, to equip them, uh, right? That's, um, that's what it is. So we'll, we'll come back to that at some point when, um, you know, right at the end. Um, now what we're going into, and, and you know, although this first session had a lot of biology, um, I know we have one, uh, one doctor on the call. I don't know if any, anybody else are doctors, um, you know, but uh, I'm not sure if, if it interests us, but I think it's very, very important to keep this in mind because how God created us, if we as parents would just about know, it actually helped us a lot. Uh, to the extent that, you know, a, a lot of parents who have journeyed with us, especially with the teen um, journey, they've said, you know, whenever we have an argument, we think about the prefrontal cortex. So if you've not written that down, you write that down, you know, so even if it is one of those heated arguments, you know, you tell yourself prefrontal cortex, and uh, then hopefully you will uh, calm down or you will just smile to yourself and uh, receive the grace that God uh, gives you for that that particular um, you know, situation. So uh, going on to the next part, next part says building strong relationships, right? Building strong relationships. And, and one thing, and these are all again, you know, it's not rocket science, but they're all things that when we put it together, when we're talking about it together, it really helps us uh, you know, think, uh, think through uh, what you may have actually decided to do before becoming parents. You said, okay, this is the kind of parent I wanna be. Somewhere down the line, you just forgot or you went you know, somewhere else. Uh, so this is just probably a reminder for some of us. Now, what does building strong uh, relationships uh, you know, mean? It is basically the home, the family, right? The home being a safe place for your teenagers, right? Sometimes we see teenagers wanting to always spend time with their friends, wanting to always go out, wanting to always stay out of the house. Uh, in a way, I was, I was probably a teenager like that, uh, you know, both my parents struggled with alcohol, especially during my teenage years. Uh, I, 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 I constantly had that thought that I just want to get out of this house. You know, that was a constant thought because I really didn't have, um, uh, you know, a, a place. I mean, it wasn't a safe place. Let's just put it that way. Right? The home was not a safe place uh, for me, at least in my teenage years. My parents uh, were wonderful parents. In fact, both of them are no more. And, and you will hear a few short stories here and there about them. And I do, I wouldn't change, uh, you know, them being my parents for anything. And I think they have inculcated uh, beautiful things in us as well. Um, but there was this part, my teenage years, I had that thought that, you know, this is not a place I should be in. I want to get out, right? So, so we as parents, what we need to remember is to give a safe environment for our children. Now, how do you do that? Especially when our, our teenagers seem like they know everything. They act like they know everything. They talk to you like they know everything. And then you, you start behaving or you start, you know, a lot of parents I speak to, I said, you know what? You guys behave worse than your teens. You know, so when your teens raise their voice, of course, what do we do? We raise our voice even higher because they don't seem to be listening or they don't seem to be hearing, you know? So, you, 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 so I think actually as parents, we behave more like teens than as parents, as when we have teens, you know? So th those are things we want to step back and say, would my teen or would my child, who, who's probably seven, nine, would they see my home or our home as a safe place? Would they see the home as a place where they can definitely come back to? Would they see their father and mother who will definitely stand by them no matter what? That's a question you need to think about, right? Do we have a relationship with our teens? One of the things that we um, keep telling parents is to have non-agenda conversations, 
right? And this is with any relationship. Even in, in marriages, we say this. You know, sometimes our relationships with our teens become so uh, to do. It's like to do. Have you done your homework? Have you kept your uniform for tomorrow? Have you submitted this? Have you this? Have you that? So that's the only conversation we have. If they have piano lessons or if they have uh, math tuitions, you're just driving them in and driving them out. And it's just a constant rut that we're all in, the, the teens as well as the parents. There is no time that you are breathing. There is no time when most of, most of us parents are just sitting with them, having a cup of coffee and actually asking them, how are you, right? A lot of parents say, you know, we've tried that, but you know, I, I don't think they even want to talk to us because they just want to be in their rooms. But you know what, try it. If we haven't done it thus far, try it. They, they have to um, imbibe the fact that you want to give them attention. There are many times when I try doing that with the phone in one hand, you know, because suddenly I remember the parenting course and suddenly I remember the things that I tell other people and then I have the phone in one hand and I'm, I'm talking to, the, to my child and the child doesn't want to talk, obviously, right? The first thing she throws back at me is, mama, you put your phone down, right? Now, I can flip back saying, yeah, you are on the phone all the time. So what is that? Who is the teen here? Right? But instead of that, I need to put the phone down. I need to create that relationship between the parent and the child to say, you are important to me. Right? So home, home relationships, family is very important for teens. Teens start behaving like it's not important. They start behaving like, you know, of course, I'm, I, when we say these things, we are not we're not generalizing. Some of our teens may be absolutely fine. They want to stay at home. Uh, you know, they're they are uh, they're very much in line with maybe what you want to see in them. But a lot of teens start rebelling, maybe in different ways. Right. Uh, the, the second thing about the home is to, to that's the place where they learn good values. Right. Many times when um, when our girls ask for something, the first thing Manoj and I look at each other and say, which one did were, were you like this when you were small and then he says no must be you i said no i'm sure i wasn't like this when i was small <laughs> you know where is this coming from right so so the value system right sometimes don't don't get confused and don't try bashing things for instance let me give you an example um our older daughter she's 13 now uh, when she was six years old she came to us and said she wants bangs and first when I heard the word bangs, I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't know. Can you imagine? I didn't know the word bangs, right? Sorry if you think I'm really old school, but it was just one of those words. Okay, I'm not that old school, but it was just one of those words, just it didn't come. Yeah, I'm sure some of the husbands are asking, what are bangs, by the way? Well, bangs are basically those, those fringes that they do with their hair in front. Right. And I used to hate that when when I grew up as a girl, I used to hate that. I was like, oh, so here is my six year old. I'm like, OK, no, 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 no. This is not supposed to come now. <laughs> this question is supposed to be when you're 10 years old, at least 11 years old, not now. But she asked the question. We had to answer it. And of course, our first response was oh, not really. Maybe it went around. But then that thing kept coming back. And I remember Manoj. Manoj comes from a home where the three boys youngest boy of three boys and I am the youngest girl of three girls so I can understand the girly stuff he cannot understand the girly stuff so he's like why is she standing in front of the mirror all the time and I'm like it's okay it's fine you know and I remember the bank conversation I said you know what so we we both went back we debated we negotiated we said you know what it's just hair at the end of the day. You know, for all you know, she'll have the haircut and then she herself will say, oh, this is terrible. I'm not going to do this again. Maybe she'll shed a tear. It's fine. Let's just give this. So we had to say, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna choose our battles, right? We're going to give in for some things that are probably non-consequential. There are other things that will be non-negotiable as far as values are concerned as a family. And as father and mother, we both need to come into agreement that, okay, this, this, these are values that are non-negotiable. Disrespect, non-negotiable. Raising your voice and speaking to a, an outsider or a guest, non-negotiable. It is not okay, right? But Bangs, nail polish, let it go. If those are conversations that are getting volcanoes in the home, not worth it, right? And we will have more of this. So home as a place of safety and acceptance, 
home as a place of learning good values. Like Manoj said in the beginning, we cannot teach them something that we ourselves don't do. I'm sure that we know this, but we have to tell you parents, we cannot teach them. We cannot expect our children to do something that we ourselves don't do. And sometimes they need to see it. So for instance, like when Manoj said in the beginning, you know, in terms of safe environment or, you know, when husbands and wives quarrel or we have a disagreement and there are there is a, uh, you know, a volume going up, they also, sometimes it's inevitable, right? Sometimes it's, it, you know, you lose it and that happens. It's okay, it's not the end of the world. We're all imperfect people trying to do this, um, you know, in the best way we can. If that happens, let the children also see how we resolve that. Let them also see how, so everything, sometimes parents make everything behind the door. The children absolutely don't learn how is, is it that they need to deal with certain things. So value systems that you have. So if you have a fight saying sorry. So, so when I say sorry to Manoj, Manoj says sorry to me and they see it, that is a value that you are teaching your children. Otherwise, what do you, what do you hear yourself say? Say sorry. Why don't you say sorry? Both of you always fighting. Why she doesn't say it? In their minds, and very soon, if you have not already heard them say We've already heard our children say that. Why don't you say sorry so quickly? We've already heard that, right? Because they're already seeing it. So as we said, the modeling of those good values is more important than the values itself or the values that we speak to them about. Um, the third thing about the home is let the home be a place of fun. When I say fun, you know, with teenagers, they want to do all sorts of things, right? In the sense, they want to probably play football. They want to probably uh, do gaming. Uh, you know, that's for another, another session. But whatever it is that they see as fun, instead of us parents just bashing that down and saying that is really bad, have a discussion with them. Right, enable them to come to a place where there, there are fun things that you as parents also do with them. Right, we've seen a lot of uh, times the, the children as they grow, they, they sort of drift apart. You know, our interests are different. So you go to a home, if there's father, mother and two children, all the four are in different directions, right? So sometimes it's good to come together and say, okay, you know what, once a week, um, let's have family time. When I say family time, I'm not just talking about praying together, very important. I'm not just talking about meals, at least one meal. You know, when we first started doing this uh, course, uh, we were surprised at, I think almost 95% of parents that had teens told us that they don't have a meal all together. You know, where the entire family sits together and have has a meal. And, and, and you know, that is one, if, if, if you can take one thing today as a practical thing, at least one meal. And now with this COVID and online work and everything, I think it's entirely possible. When you have that one meal together, you're seeing each other. Because there are fathers sometimes who say, I didn't know you grew up so much. When did this happen? You know, because sometimes you're not even seeing. When I say see, you're not looking at your children you don't have the time either when you have the time they don't have the time or when they have the time you don't have the time right and that's not okay so when you say one meal together we're going to really try and get at least one meal together have conversations over the meal not have the tv on not have devices on the side not just for the children but also for the parents then you're having a conversation, right? And through that, even that meal time can be a fun time. So when I say fun, it's not just about going and doing something outside. I'm just saying those are intentional decisions and choices that we make as parents that we set. And these things that you set will be set for life. You know, these things that you model will, will become something that they will take into their homes when they grow up. Right, so fun things, make it fun, ask them, talk to them, you know, try and understand what their world is like, um, you know, and maybe take them out once a week uh, to, to a place that they like. Of course, with COVID, there are all sorts of uh, uh, And also home as a place to learn about relationships. Like I said, to nurture relationships, to nurture friendships. So if you don't say that thank you, if you don't say that sorry as an adult, if they don't see you do that, uh, then it's it's very less likely that they would do that themselves, right? So um, yeah, so those are the four things: home, family, um, as a safe place, 
um, uh, home as a place to learn good values, home as a place of fun, home as a place to learn about relationships. And I sometimes, you know, when we speak to parents, they say, we don't know how to be fun for them because sometimes our generation, you know, the gap in generations now are getting shorter and shorter. So sometimes they say they can't relate to us, we can't relate to them, right? And this is where you have got to trust God. You have got to ask God to give you wisdom, to give you the desire to be able to come to their, you know, their level, wherever they are. You know, if it's a boy, it's different. If it's a girl, it's different. Girls like to paint their nails and, you know, put little dots on it. And if you can just give one hour to that and appreciate them for that, that's fun for them. And, and it's just not fun. What's going into their heads that we as parents are interested in them, not just what, what we are interested in, but we're interested in them. You know, that's the message you're giving, right? So things like that, to, to ask God for the wisdom, to ask God to show you what is it that, um, you know, we can do as parents. So family time, as I said, you know, once a week, uh, either going out or even just having a meal in the home is very, very important together right also uh, helping siblings build relationships between them is very important this is not just about parent to child it's also if god has given you more than one child how do you enable them to be the siblings that god wants them to be right and um the other thing is family holidays again these seem to be very basic things uh, but we're having to uh, emphasize this because it's 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 not necessarily very common right sometimes we're just too busy sometimes the only holidays we do is go to visit our you know their grandparents or our parents which is hardly a holiday uh, because you're you you know you're meeting all the uncles and aunts and children reach a stage where they just don't enjoy that they just do it because they have to do it uh, we're talking about a holiday just the your family right? The father, mother, and children. If it's one, two, four, just you guys, right? And it doesn't have to be an expensive holiday, right? And this is something that we put in place a few years ago, and we try to do this going for a long period of time is not an option for us. So we sometimes do it thrice, uh, sorry, twice a year, but just three or four days uh, yeah, together. Lindsay, Lindsay said thrice, I made it twice. Yeah, it's actually twice slip of the tongue. Um, so twice a year. So if you can do one big 10 day holiday, great, you know, do that or however it works for you. But when you do that, again, what is the message you're, you're passing on to your child that you are important to us, right? We are important to us. So when we do that, when we model that, then for them also, we will be important. Right. So those are things that go a long way, um, you know, and we've seen that even in our own home, we have seen that they see it, you know, and, and like I said, it doesn't have to be an expensive holiday. Uh, for the last four years, we've been going to Uti, I think, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll probably, uh, uh, you know, that, that the, the, the place will be named after us if we keep doing this. So the children also sometimes ask, uh, you know, can't we go anywhere else? And then when we say, okay, we're going on the holiday, they're happy with that, right? They're happy, okay, we're going, it's fine, let's go. Yes, they do go through that time when they talk about their peers, they say, oh, you know, all my friends go to Singapore and, uh, uh, you know, Paris and Dubai and, and you know, we keep going to Uti. So that, yes, we do have those conversations. We don't have children who don't debate that. Of course, we go through that. And, and you know, we come to a concession, a consensus and we say, okay, at least thank God we can do this. You know, and that's what we do. And, and, and I think more than all the other debates and arguments, just when we go as a family, uh, it makes a huge difference. You know, it makes a huge difference, even for us as parents, where we're not always busy. We're not always wired for the next thing that we need to do. And we're able to give time to our children, right? So those are the few things that are there in the section of just building that strong relationship. Some of us may already be doing it, some of us may be getting some ideas as we are speaking, but whatever God is putting in your heart, write it down and do it. You know, don't say, okay, you know what, I've got this, I'm doing this extra course, I'm studying, you know, maybe the mother or the father is studying now, and after this, I will do it, or after the boards, I will do it. I hear this so many times, parents think, after their boards, we will do it. You know, after this, we will do it don't keep it for that of course if they're going through boards like uh, um, milo's uh, children they're going through boards right now i'm not saying take them out for dinner today if they have math tomorrow uh, but I, I, i'm just saying that you know do it 
quickly. Do it quickly, do it consistently, do it intentionally. With any relationship, if you've got to see transformation, do it now, right? Do it quickly, do it consistently, and do it intentionally. Don't do it for the sake of doing it, right? As parents, God will give you the wisdom as to what you need to do um, and how you need to do it, depending on, uh, you know, your children, the children that God has given you, right? Um, now, the next section is uh, one of my favorite sections, and some of you probably have heard this a million times before, the love languages, right? Now, um, as far as our teens are concerned, there are huge emotional needs that they have, right? Uh, the, the, the problem is we, we've seen that when parents even talk to us about the teens, they talk to us like they're talking about an adult, right? And we have to remind them that, listen, he's just 12. Or listen, she's just 15, right? So we have to remind the parents that they have emotional needs. There are some parents who um, may have come to, come to know the Lord much later in their lives, right? Uh, maybe just last year and the teens are already teens. So till then there were things we used to watch, there were things we used to do. And we have decided as parents to follow Jesus and, and slowly start, you know, start walking in that. Now we cannot expect the teens also to quickly flip because we decided. So you have to enable them. You have to be patient with them, right? So there are emotional needs that your teens have, even if they show it or don't show it, right? Because a lot of parents say, you know, I think earlier he used to come and hug me a lot, but now he's a little awkward. You know, he doesn't know what to do, especially boys, you know, um, they're very awkward. Girls also, I hear, are a little awkward when they reach, say, eighth standard, ninth standard. If you go hug, they're a little, you know, awkward, especially, you know, dads and daughters sometimes. So whatever that is, let me tell you that they have emotional needs, right? Uh, their, their way of showing or their way of responding may change. It doesn't mean that they don't, they don't need love or they don't need to see love. Right? Because many times as parents, we say, okay, let me give her space. Let me give him space. And now what happens with that is it comes to a place where we start becoming strangers to our own children. And there are times when uh, teens speak to me and they oftentimes say, I don't think my parents love me. Even in situations where I know that I know that I know that this particular parent or parent set love this child but this child is saying it right so i can't even dismiss that i can't diminish that and say oh no 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 it's not i have to acknowledge what she's feeling so as a parent then we have to go back and see why would my child think that i don't love her how could she even think like that or how could he even think like that right and then you're able to step back a little bit and along with god see what are the actions what are the things that i need to do as a parent to ensure to assure my child that they are loved like we saw in the beginning that first wheel the center is love you take love out there's no point in anything else that you and i do Sometimes we say we're working so hard, you know, father and mother working so hard. We, we need all this money because we're putting you in great schools and all those things, you know, children. And we expect them to understand. I mean, we ourselves are wrapping our brain around life. And then we expect them to understand. And, and I think that would be unfair, right? They, they don't understand. All they want is your attention and your affection. So they have emotional needs. And this is the time that they are like we started off. They're going through, through puberty. Hormones are changing. Their body is changing. Their mind is changing. They're able to grasp. They, 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 they receive Jesus. Like even our daughters, they receive Jesus at the age of seven. And they were on fire when they were, uh, you know, that age, uh, they would hear God's voice, they would, uh, you know, speak, uh, speak it very boldly, they would pray very boldly. And then slowly, 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 you can see the shyness coming in, uh, the consciousness coming in, the same child. And you're like, oh, I thought this was sorted. What happened here? Right? So even if there are children who, uh, you know, behave in a certain way when they're children and slowly as they come into that puberty and teens, we need to be patient with them. That is normal, right? 
But then how do we know that they are okay? That is only if you have a relationship with them. Like I said in the previous case, each of us have to invest in that relationship with them, in knowing them. As parents, it's not okay to say, I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what he's going through. I don't know what she's going through. That's not okay, right? So because God, you know, God of the universe is here to help you and me. So ask him for help and invest time into knowing your, your child, you know, whatever the age of that child is, right? So they're going through a lot of, um, a lot of stuff. One of the things we also see teens going through at this age is they're pushing for independence, right? I think uh, Lena in the beginning said, you know, she used to be quite um, sort of submissive. Now we're seeing a streak. And I think most of you said a streak of rebellion, a streak of talking back, a streak of even the look, uh, you know, that is so different from what it used to be. That's because naturally they're growing and they're pushing for independence, right? They're trying to do things on their own. And we've been, of course, training them in different areas. But in some areas, we want them to conform to what, what we say. And it's very confusing for the child, right? So be aware that these are the thoughts that they're going through. And they have something called an emotional tank, an emotional tank. You know, think of it as an emotional tank. And this is, again, something that sticks with parents when we do this course for three weeks or seven weeks. That's another word that sticks with them. If the emotional tank is empty or less full, then they tend to be snappy. They tend to be unreasonable. They tend to be not wanting to talk to you, not wanting to see your face, right? So which means before that, you need to invest in that relationship, assure them that they are loved and that love tank, that emotional tank needs to be filled with love, right? Both from the father and the mother, wherever possible, as far as possible, right? On a daily basis. How do you do that? You know, you may tell me, I mean, my child is doing 10 standard and all she can, she can do is study. When do I fill the emotional tank? Well, ask God, because what's the point of the child finishing 10th and being depressed. What's the point? And, and this is not, this is not uh, you know, me just saying it, but there are so many teenagers that are going through clinical depression. These, this is not even a loose word that we use anymore. They're going through clinical depression. How do they get there? How do they get there, right? So even if they miss a year in 10th or 12th or whatever, let them know that they are loved. Let them know that they can depend on their father and their mother no matter what. Whatever the, their friends say, whatever the teacher says, whatever social media says, they should be able to come back home, whether they say it or not, in their minds, in their hearts, deep inside. They should be able to know, my dad will stand by me no matter what. My mom will stand by me no matter what. These may not be words they can articulate or they may, they may have too much pride to say it, but let them believe it. And how do we do that? By these things, by these things that we just said and, and filling their emotional tank. Now the love languages, a lot of us are very familiar with, uh, you know, uh, the book uh, written by Gary Chapman on the five love languages. Um, and, and, you know, maybe, maybe each of you, when you think of it, maybe you have other ways as well. It's not written in stone. Um, but I just want to take us through the five love languages. For some of us, it's familiar. For some of us, maybe it's new. Some of us may have heard and forgotten. What are the five love languages and what does it mean? Just like a spoken language, love has a language, right? As we know in the Bible, love is a fruit of the spirit, right? It, it doesn't say it's a seed. It says it's a fruit, which means you can see it. It's evident, right? So the same way, if you think of love, if I tell Manoj that I love him, there is a language with which I will say it, not just the English language, with, with everything else as well, my actions as well, right? Because many times we may not be able to, we can't keep saying, I love you, I love you all the time through the day 24 seven, right? There are so many other ways in which you can, you, can, you can show love to another person. The same way, there are ways in which you receive love. So I just want to say on the onset, the way we show love is, 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 is the same way we want to receive love, right? So for example, uh, there are five love languages that is there as per, as per Gary Chapman. Um, I'll just quickly say the names of it and you will understand it. One is time, right? Some of us show love through time or want to see love through time. Some of us, it's words, affirming words. 
uh, some of us it's touch, it's physical touch, a hug, uh, you know, a, a kiss. Uh, some of us it's through presence, thoughtful presence. And some of us it's through actions, right? Time, words, touch, presence, actions. I will go over each of them a little bit uh, in detail, but I just wanted to say that. Now between Manoj and me, our love languages are very different, right? right? Uh, for me, I need a hug. And for all those of you who are in the marriage uh, workshop, you've heard this before, uh, but sorry, you have to hear it again. Um, I need that hug. If I don't get that hug, at least now I'm a little better, I'm, I'm a little more mature, but the first few years of our marriage, <laughs> the, <laughs> okay, okay, wait. <laughs> the first few years of our marriage, if I didn't get that hug, I would be really upset. And in my mind, like a fast train, I have gone to the conclusion that he does not love me, right? And then I, he, he is oblivious. He's watching cricket, right? But I have decided, of course, to follow Jesus, but I have decided <laughs> that my husband doesn't love me. And then what happens? I, my behavior towards him starts emulating that. And he is totally confused because he's only looking at the TV and the cricket score, right? And so it's very confusing. And of course, that will cause a gap that will cause strife, that will cause expectations to be up and down, right? Manoj's love language is actions, right? Actions. He, he, so we always say, you know, the morning tea, Manoj is the one who makes, he makes very good tea and he brings that tea. So now, even if I wake up early, I will not make tea because it's like me getting my hug, right? So I wait for him, he goes to the kitchen, makes tea, comes, gives me a hug because with the tea now over a, a period of time, he's realized that, you know, I take my hug, which is rightfully mine, right? So what am I trying to say? We're very different people, right? If he doesn't get a hug from me, he's absolutely fine. <laughs> he, he doesn't miss a thing, but then he has to deal with it. He gets his hug, whether he likes it or not. But he has understood that that is my love language and that that really matters to me. I can I can cook three meals. I can I can do whatever I need to do. But give me that one hug, which means that physical touch is very high for me as a love language. Right. And for those of you who know me, uh, it is the same even with uh, my broader relationships. Right. Uh, there are so many women that call me like mama bear because they just like that one hug, you know, that big hug. Right. I love I, I love to share love that way. Right. So that that's what we're trying to say. Now, the same thing, try and take it with your team. Now, if you are speaking in French and your teen only understands Malayalam, What's going to happen? It's going to be a sad story because we will keep speaking in French and they will keep hearing or wanting to hear in Malayalam because that's the only language they understand. I'm talking about love here, right? We will keep doing something for them and we're thinking we are showing love, but they're not recognizing it because they're saying, dad never has time for me, you know? But dad's way of showing love is presence. You know, so wherever he goes, he gets presents for the child and the children love the cars and the trains and the toys and the gadgets. And, you know, uh, if it's girls, then they love their clothes and they love their hair and their makeup and this and that. But they still say they don't love me. Why is that? Because they want daddy's time. They understand love in the, in the, in the, in the medium of time, right? But then dad doesn't have time. Right. And, and dad will say, OK, I'm doing this. So why, why can't you understand? Well, we need to we need to come to that place because we are the adults and they are the children. Keep reminding yourself and say, OK, you know what? I need to understand what she she wants. I need to understand how she receives love and I need to be able to love her or him that way. Right. So just to elaborate quickly on on these five love languages, I'm sure it's fairly clear. Uh, time is a big one right? Try, uh, we, we also tell the parents, if you have more than one child, try and spend time with each child separately, right? And when I say this, please don't let this bog you down because if you are in a busy job, uh, you know, if you're taking care of your elderly parents and there are so many responsibilities, you may think, when am I going to find the time? But commit that to God. God will expand your time, right? You say, Lord, I want to, you know, Jesus always, if you think of when Jesus was here on earth, 
uh, when, when anybody came to him, the first thing Jesus asked is, what do you want? What do you want? So if we come to aligning our wants with God's and say, God, I want to spend time with my child. I want to spend quality time with my child. I want to ensure that he or she knows that I love her, that I, I will always be there for her. I don't know how to say these words, but more than the words, I want them to know. Teach me, Lord. Just do that and he will give you. He will give you the spirit, right? Uh, to lead you. So the first is time, you know, consider spending more time with each of your children, affirming words. Now, I cannot tell you how important words is. And I think the Bible talks a lot about words, words that we speak. You know, even God takes offense if we speak praise from the same mouth and if we, if we speak unclean things from the same mouth. So the same thing applies even to our home, even to every relationship God has given us, right? So if we choose to call our children names, it is not okay, right? It is not okay because that goes and sticks in their hearts. It sticks in their minds. It sticks into the foundation of their identity. If we hear useless, if we hear idiot, if we hear stupid, you know, I don't know if there are worse words, but whatever. I'm just saying this. I'm not saying any of us may even use those, but all I'm saying is that's not okay. Even if it's a casual thing, it's not okay, right? Even in a joking way, even in our home, uh, uh, there is this ad that uh, that says, you know, uh, I, I forget, I forget the name of the boy. I'm sure one of you will remember. Tera sabun slow hai kya? You know that ad? You know, there's one guy who's washing. Yeah, he says. So we sometimes tease our older kid. We used to tease her with that. Like the younger one is, you know, she's very quick in doing something. And the older one, she takes her own sweet time. She's the creative one. So we used to make a joke out of it. But, you know, in this last year or so, we've seen that, that aspect in her, our older kid, where she's saying, no, I'm not good enough. And we're like, where is this coming from? And she has a lot of talents, a lot of things. Like, I don't think any of us, you know, in the family has as much talent as our older kid but yet she uh, ha, you know keeps on making statements that i'm not good enough no i i'm not okay and and you know even with others we've heard her say that and we're like oh gosh how did this happen i thought we got all the all the things right but then we realized that even as a joke when we say things and when we keep saying things it's not okay because those things goes and settles in their heart because they don't know like manoj said their their brains their senses don't know how to respond to that so they take you know they take the information they don't know how to process it accurately so please be aware of what we speak to our children the other thing is maybe we are very quiet parents and we don't say anything even that is not okay right so if the child really needs to hear if their love language is just words spoken to them then that is very important right so one of the things that we we say research shows that for every negative word or negative you know make your bed is sort of a negative <laughs> negative thing right it sounds negative but every negative thing that you tell them let there be at least five positive things that you tell them right for every negative thing let there be at least five positive things that's how you build them up as confident children as positive children as children that know that they can do this you know that their parents are supporting them their parents are backing them they're not useless they're not idiots they're not fools right so even if they hear it outside this is what they're getting at home so they're very very cemented Right, so affirming words is a big one. The third one is each of you need to know how they like, you know, to be touched. When I say it's, it's even, you know, just doing that maybe with your, if it's a mother and son, I think mothers probably find it more easier to, uh, you know, physically nurture your children. For fathers, it's a little different and it's different for different people. Sometimes even the girls find it very awkward. You know, I can see uh, my older kid getting a little awkward. Both of them are very, very physical with Manoj in terms of hugs and stuff. But I can see that the older kid's getting a little awkward with, with Manoj. And we're very respectful. We're very mindful of that, right? So be mindful of that. Respect them. If they're starting to get embarrassed, you know, with the way they're growing up and things, be aware of that, right? But don't, don't stay away from that, 
right? So as especially the mothers, I think will uh, will understand this and keep that physical contact uh, with your children. It's very important. Thoughtful presence, of course, it's obvious. Uh, now it's probably the the other way, the other spectrum. because our children just keep wanting and wanting and wanting. They're like, this one thing you buy for me, I will not ask anything after that. You know, they say, okay, we want, uh, um, now of course with devices, everybody wants a device. So they're like, okay, just get us a laptop and then we're not gonna ever ask you for anything. And they're just 10 and 13, as though, right? <laughs> we know better, right? So anyway, so that's the other extreme, but I'm not talking about those, I'm talking about the little things. You know, even when, when our children were younger, even in the lunch box, I used to keep little treats, just one little chocolate that they like with a little note. And they go, go to school and then they find the chocolate as a little surprise and they see a little note saying, you know, I love you or something really fun for them. What is that? It's a little thoughtful present. So we're not talking about big things. We're talking about just being thoughtful. For, for some children, that's a huge, that's a big love language, right? Uh, and the fifth one is kind actions, actions, you know, doing things. Uh, they are also in that age where they want to see you do things, you know, because they, they're questioning, why, why isn't Dada doing it? Why should we only us do it? You know, whether it's washing dishes or, you know, helping them with the homework or helping them with their bed when they have exams or whatever it may be, what, whichever way you, you, uh, you know, do those actions. Because sometimes as parents or, or fathers, mothers, if we are working, we say we already do so many things in the office, at least at home, you know, we just want to rest. But please be aware that your children are not in your office to see how you do things right? They don't understand that world. They don't need to understand that world. So all the actions that you do is in the home, right? And, and towards them, personally towards them. The general stuff you do at home is different, but personally towards them, making something that they like to eat, small thing, but they, they love that, you know? And, and they know, what are they, do, what are they seeing? Oh, mama loves me. When I make pancakes, mama loves me. That's what they're hearing. That's what they're seeing. That's the love language they're receiving. That's what I mean. Right. So those are the five love languages. It's very, very useful to keep in mind for any relationship to understand, you know, even between a married couple, husband and wife. If, if you sometimes wonder, you know, especially wives, we make statements like, yeah, I know you don't have time for me. You don't love me. You know, husbands, just just think maybe it is because there is a love language you need to figure out of your wife. You know, so uh, we have an exercise, a quick exercise you know, that's there in your, uh, um, in the message, but I'm going to ask uh, Shino and Tijin to put it at the chat as well. We're going to give you another five to seven minutes. And um, what this is basically is the five love languages, put it in order of how it is for you and how it is for your child. So for example, if I say from the five love languages, my topmost that I really want to see is physical touch. The second is time. The third is words. Like that's the order. I mean, I don't care much for presence or I don't care much, you know, like, so if you put that order for yourself first, so this is how I show my love, put that down and then do it for your child. Of course, if you have more than one child, you'll need to do it for, uh, you know, different children because all of them understand things very differently, right? So uh, take about five to seven minutes to just, Try and apply what you just heard, and then we'll come back and move on.
Are we done? Are we all, are we all doing okay? I think I can see some of you have finished. You're looking up, so I think it's done. Some of you probably will need a little more time, but you can, yeah, you can complete it. You can probably think about it. Um, maybe a little later, you know, after we finish as well, mull over it. Uh, we have a small little um, session, um, you know, next, that's the last bit of um, the session for today. And then we have about 20, 25 minutes for uh, Q&A. So it's more interaction and, you know, questions you have, things that you take away that you can apply uh, so that it's more interactive. We try to, try to do it this way so that we can keep time. So I'm just going to hand it over to Manoj to take you through the next uh, part of it. Okay. Um, so, so far we've been discussing keeping the end in mind uh, and how important it is to have a long-term view when we are raising our children, teenagers. Uh, we spoke about transition from adolescent years into a teenage year. Uh, and then we touched on building strong relationships uh, with the love languages and just the environment around the home. Uh, now talking about communication, which is what I want to just touch upon effective communication. Here's something that's helped. Um, you know, the Bible says, uh, be slow to speak and quick to listen. This is something that's personally helped me, uh, not just with regards to teens, but in life. Um, you know, statistics prove that the average person interrupts every 17 seconds. How many of us have that problem? <laughs> so that's point one. That's where we need to start work on and say, God, please help me on this. Um, so slow to speak, quick to listen. In a nutshell is what communication is all about. It's not so much what you say. And if you go back to that wheel, more than what you say, it's what you model. So keep this in mind. This is God's wisdom that is given to you and me and it's freely available. You don't have to pay for it. Right? Model listening, which means how do you do that? You listen for feelings and emotions because the team cannot express or articulate everything he or she is going through. Don't expect him or her to tell you everything that's going on in their lives. Don't expect that. That's an unrealistic expectation. But be available for them, like we touched on, uh, and especially for the fathers who are on this group. Um, this is very important for fathers, together with the mothers, to play this role. Availability for your child. And that's how we communicate that they are the most important thing to us as parents, being available for them. So those of you who have busy jobs, uh, fathers and husbands who are not on this forum, maybe the wives, you should be able to communicate this back to them um, to just help them understand how important this is. I'll give you a few things, insights into how important it is for the father to be around when the child is growing up. The absence of a father is proven to be more drastic than human poverty. It is a result for a lot of juvenile delinquency because the father is not around. This is proven. History has proven these things. So um, God has created both the father and the mother to raise children. And so the absence of a father we're not only talking about physical absence, proxy fathers who are in the home, but they don't play an active part in the raising of a child. So many of you may be feeling like the entire load is on you as mothers, as wives. It also applies in such cases. So the father is busy with gadgets, watching movies, cricket, whatever it may be, not very actively involved in raising the child. So the entire burden falls on the wife and the mother. So um, the absence of a father is a stronger factor than poverty and many times results in juvenile delinquency. A father's presence 
this may seem very simple, especially at dinner time, is proven to stimulate a child to perform better in school and in life. So here's another cue to take dinner time especially seriously because that is so special. It's the last thing that the child experiences before he or she goes to bed. And it needs to be a memorable one. Now we understand there are cases where because of economic reasons, you know, the husband or the father has to be away. We understand that. Um, but we are talking about if you and I can do something about it, then we should start being intentional about that, praying in that direction and saying that this is important. Don't worry about what happened in the past. You can't go back and change it. But we are talking about moving forward. Teenage girls, those of you who have daughters, teenage girls, um, many of them who are suffering from eating disorders, a large percentage of them have been linked to the absence of a father. Okay. I'm just sharing this because just to convey the importance of a father. Okay. The absence of a father contributes to a child's low self-esteem. A very low motivation for achievement. Talking from a church context, one in four young people say that they've never had a meaningful conversation with their father. And the percentage is equally the same, if not more. They say one in four or one in three say their fathers seldom or never show love towards them. Why am I giving you these facts? This is all part of communication. The fathers who are on this forum, I want to encourage you, please take this seriously. Uh, God has set the father and the mother in the home to raise children. It's not just the mother's responsibility. Now, going back to what I started with, slow to speak, quick to listen is the most effective means of communicating. Look for feelings, look for emotions. How can you do that? How was your day? What was your day like on online class now that we're all stuck at home? What did you learn? Is there something that stood out to you? Have conversations, not just about classroom settings. What did you go out and do today? I mean, you went out with your friends. What did you like? I mean, did you enjoy something? Can you tell me something? Have non-agenda conversations with your children. You need to put an effort in that direction. Because many times we talk only about things. We are adults, remember? You remember about the brain? We want to have conversations that have a logical conclusion, not our teenagers. Mm. They just want to have a discussion with no clear conclusion. That is their world. And as you and I enter their world, you start making a relational connect. So have these kinds of conversations, not just about their academics, but how are you doing? Look for their feelings. Is there a sense of fear? Is there a sense of like Lindsay mentioned, I don't think I'm good enough. Low self-esteem. Are you seeing that fathers and mothers? What are you doing about it? That's what I'm saying. Look, pay attention. So if I'm not available in my mind, I'm always on my iPhone or Blackberry or phone or whatever, checking emails or shopping on Amazon. I'm not available. I'm emotionally not available for the children. So availability is key, key, key. And I can talk for myself after 20, 25 years of corporate experience. One of the reasons I gave up a corporate life is for the children. Because every time I used to come back from travel, I used to see there was to be a change in the way they respond to me personally. They still love me. I bring them all their presents. But I found that there was a distinct shift in the way they respond to me when I'm away from them. Presence matters. That's the way God's created us. So don't try and fill your child's life with a lot of goodies and presents. There's only that much that they value. They value the presence of the father and the mother. So that's availability. Be quick to listen. Look for emotions and feelings. 
try to avoid interrupting. Work on that. Um, and something that's very, very important for fathers and mothers, which I thought is important as we close out this section. We've been talking about building relationships, especially from an Indian parenting context. This is something that will help us. Rules without a relationship will create rebellion in the home. Rules without relationship creates rebellion. So what does that mean? Do this, don't do that. And you may be right in it, but if you're just focusing on the rules around the home, but you don't have a relationship with your child, it will create both active and passive rebellion. But rules plus relationship in the ways that we spoke about, the love languages, the availability, and so on and so forth, modeling, a combination of those things. The rules plus relationship creates a positive environment in the home. And that positive environment positively enhances the brain of that teenager. You remember the connectors, the synapses? You are giving them a positive environment where they're able to flourish and grow as children, safe, secure, knowing that they are not under any threat, under any danger. I want to leave it at that because there's a lot of stuff that was communicated this evening. Um, but I just want to open it up. You know, any, any thoughts, comments, questions, um, clarifications, we are happy to offer. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we have about 20, 25 minutes set aside just for that. So we can make this interactive and everything that you heard, I know it's a lot. Um, this is actually a, supposed to be a six to seven weekend um, course. Uh, with a lot more group discussions and things like that, but we also mindful and know that it's very difficult to, you know, have parents set aside this time. So we've tried to, you know, sort of um, put a lot more into uh, one week. So do bear with us. Uh, but we thought the interaction will help, you know, if there's any question. But just with one thing that um, Manoj shared, uh, you know, he normally always says that uh, when he mentions it. So I'm just going to, you know, take uh, take that and say is, um, I know that for some of us in some families, um, parents might be divorced, parents might be separated, uh, there could also be death, right? So if you're a single parent, either a father or a mother, always know that according to your situations, according to your particular situation, you can't, there is only that much you can control. You can't go back and change your past, but according to your situation, God gives the grace. He fills the gap, right? So if, if, if a mother is taking care of the children uh, on her own, for whatever reason, she will be given the fathering and the mothering grace. So the reason why we emphasize these things is so that we as parents are aware of these things. We are aware in terms of why they are responding in a particular way. We, we shouldn't take things personally, you know? So I just wanted to add that um, to what Manoj mentioned. And now we will just open it out uh, for questions, for maybe just takeaways, um, you know, from, from today, from this evening. Sometimes when we share, it becomes a lot clearer. Uh, you know, uh, as to what uh, was your highlight for the evening? What is it that you're going to definitely take and apply from this evening onwards, maybe? Um, uh, you know, so that'll really help us as well as, you know, everyone else on this, um, on this forum. So I'm going to open it out. So the quicker we talk, the quicker we can have much more, uh, you know, set into it. We're going to do this till about 7.55. And then the last few minutes, we'll just close out and close in prayer. So go ahead. Who wants to go first? Hey, this, this is Nestor. Um, one of the things that, you know, professionally, I've always been a process guy and uh, I fix processes. <laughs> so, so, you know, when, uh, and exactly a lot of the things that you spoke about when you're saying that, you know, when you said 
the, the exact term he said, you know, I thought this was already <laughs> fixed. That is the exact same words that went through my mind at various moments. And I'm like, man, wasn't this looked after? Didn't we already have a permanent fix? We agreed on a solution. We agreed on a way forward. You model those behaviors. I saw that it was working. You know, why are we back at this, you know, a couple of years later? So, so that was something that uh, hit very closely to home. I understand, of course, that, you know, Parenting is a walk by faith, you know, not by sight. So we see where they need to be. And, and that's what we are, we are building them towards. But at the same time, doing something in, in uh, the, the now, in the physical is essentially important. And, and uh, yes, so, so there's, there's learning. And one key thing is uh, to work on that part of, you know, my daughter accusing me of being an unfun parent. So <laughs> making home more a place of fun. Yes, yeah, so that's one key takeaway from today. Great, Thank you. great message. Yeah, just just the the point that you mentioned about, um, you know, didn't we fix this? Just to emphasize that with children, you need to repeat yourself um, again and again and again. And I'm sure we all have the statement in our vocabulary. How many times? How many times do I tell you? How many times do I have to say something, right? And 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 God just took that off my vocabulary because you know He started asking me that as an adult. How many times? Right, but with children, every year, every every few months, they are changing. Their hormones, their mental abilities are changing. So the way you're telling them, so if you tell them that God is their savior at seven years, they understand it in a particular way. But when they're eight years old, the same thing, they have a question because they're seeing a little more, they're processing a little more, and then you have to say it again. Right? When they're nine years old, you have to say it again because they understand it differently. When they're 13 years old, you have to say it all over again. Right, So there, there is a lot of repeat, repetition that we need to do as parents and we need to be patient with that because they're not adults yet. Right, And that's a, that's a fact. And if we can just grasp that, that really helps a lot of us from losing um, you know, sleep or losing our cool or our blood pressure going high, uh, you know, it'll really help us if we keep that in mind. So thank you so much, Nestor, for uh, sharing that, bringing that up. Who else wants to go? Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Anna. Hi. So the whole session was, a, I mean, I, there was so many takeaways. There's absolutely so many takeaways. I had no idea what to expect from this, but I am so glad that I, uh, that I attended. Uh, my greatest takeaway was the five love languages. And I think, uh, like you said, you know, in a marriage, there is love language. And similarly for children, now I know exactly what, uh, you know, maybe where we could be, uh, where we could work on, you know, because I think that I'm giving them all that I can, but yeah. this is so important. And I didn't know that, you know, there were these specific uh, love languages. And maybe I'm, I'm definitely going to try and apply that. But no, thank you so much. The whole session was great. But I really, this really uh, struck out to me, you know. So thanks. Thanks a lot. Great. Great. Praise God. Who wants to go next? Thanks, Anna. Hi, this is Nestlin here. Okay, so I think I just enjoyed the entire session very meaningful, very thoughtful. And I think a lot of learnings as we have, uh, you know, uh, um, 18 year old and 16 year old, I think we have failed many times. So we are still, I think, going through and in the process <laughs> and uh, so much of learning. And I, especially, I know, I just like that uh, uh, prefrontal, uh, you know, it was, you know, it's <laughs> cortex is yeah, developing, you know, <laughs> because, uh, that's so very true uh, because I tend to also put myself as, you know, uh, maybe not in their shoes. Mm -hmm. So I tend to think out of as an adult, you know, they should come up to my level of thought process or whatever it is. So I make a major blunder in that area. <laughs> so I think, you know, this is really even I, I'm into counseling and things like that. But when you come into your own children, kind of you know tend to fail <laughs> and uh, so this was really so thoughtful I think now I'm just trying to put that thought into my mind every time you know I have to just keep reminding of myself that you know it's yet to develop yes. uh, and uh, you know that's uh, very good you know thank you so much and also the love languages and everything you know we tend to go according to our own love languages mm -hmm. but you know we need to think about our children's love language here so that we can you know get into their shoes so 
thank you so much been uh, blessed thank you thank you neslin great wonderful that you can take very specific thing and apply who else okay uh, the veterans of the group right so okay <laughs> i tell you why uh, we try and do this as often as we can because uh, after four kids uh, you uh, wonder where your pre cortex frontal whatever it's called <laughs> you wonder if you have it at all right so uh, to tell you the truth that uh, while we were doing the session amrit was saying he feels he's at 16 and i said i think i'm somewhere close to 24 maybe but uh, jokes aside uh, for me for us i think what for me personally as a mom i would like to give you my perspective is that uh, my oldest daughter is uh, 20 now and my youngest is 7 right so we have two brats in between uh, which uh, counts for most of the parenting sessions but uh, uh, to tell you the truth that like you know the first slide that we saw uh, irrespective of all the processes that can go into uh, successful parenting i think the hub that makes all the difference the love right so for us uh, oldest daughter was jessica was pr pretty much the guinea pig where you were figuring out what is what and uh, thankfully she's turned out right and i would really attribute that only to that hub called love that's all we could give uh, her and uh, i think more also more importantly is that uh, we taught her to focus on god's love right and uh, if there's anything i would do differently uh, as a mom Uh, i would say that call out those things that you don't see in your children right instead of uh, repeatedly calling them out uh, and saying okay this is wrong that is wrong calling them names or whatever but that's exactly what god also says right in his word he says call those things that are not seen you know as though they already are so yeah that's my take away uh, the love wheel absolutely thanks yeah. thank you who else Yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of takeaways. Um, I don't have a team, but just wanted to prepare before they get to their teams. I think choosing our battles um, uh, and also that they don't understand uh, the problems that they're causing many a time. Just to be aware of that, that they don't understand that uh, for the home to be a place of fun, uh, to do things consciously with them, fun things, and uh, if their love tank is less than full or empty, that's why they're getting snappy. um you know teens cannot articulate what they're going through i think you don't have to get to teens level i think even before that i guess they start that uh just our availability and i think one of the main things is uh, uh rules without relationship uh leads to rebellion and uh, also a big question is am i listening uh you know or are we just being busy so i think there's so many takeaways but these things really uh were really really um, key uh, i mean these for me so yeah great great thanks thanks miri ravi who else yeah i think as we share it also reiterates things in each other's minds right yeah go ahead go ahead sumiti one thing that stood out for me was is your child liking to be at your home or just wanting to go out then what kind of environment are you creating in your family that the child wants to stay or wants to go out that's uh, one thing and then yes we try to speak to our children but the thing uh, that manoj uh, reiterated uh, that listen don't uh, is, we say okay how was your day uh, what did you learn and when they come out with something then we again tell them something because we don't listen we think okay this is wrong this is right we want to add value to it so that is the place i think we have to keep repeatedly should ring, uh, linger in our mind keep quiet listen Yeah, yeah. These two. So let the 17 seconds uh, flash. The interrupting. Oh. That needs to go up now for all of us. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Manoj. And uh, one of the important thing that uh, we uh, took uh, is uh, basically that uh, time, uh, the father's time to the children is very important, and. Uh, 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 in a corporate world uh, like most of the time dads uh, don't have that kind of a quality time and uh, that is something that uh, we have to work out uh, i felt thank mm -hmm. you so much for this uh, thank you yeah wonderful thanks so much yes make time we have a we have a text uh, from chris 
how do we intentionally undo the unhealthy things we did when our kids were younger and we didn't know better and seeing the effects now it's a great question uh, chris and i'm sure many of us find ourselves in places like that but i want not just for chris but for all of us to point us back to the nature of god god is bigger than our mistakes question is do we truly believe it but having said that there's something else that the bible teaches and everything is based on god's word now whatever we hope to achieve in this life romans 9 and verse 16 says it is not based on man's effort on human will but it is god who has mercy so what does that mean wherever you are you are at a point in your life chris today maybe the kids have grown up and you're beginning to see the effects of all the things that you didn't know don't beat yourself up as a couple don't beat yourself up i understand you have a young baby where you are today believe that god will give you the grace with whatever you have taken not just from this forum but from every other parenting forum that you've been a part of and you will be a part of start to put into practice the things that you can okay set small goals for yourself uh if your husband's around uh you know both of you set small goals what do you want to achieve in the next one month take it at a 30 day goal what do you want to do right don't try and you know take on the whole thing because it can become very burdensome take one thing set a 30 day goal and what is it that you want to achieve as parents and then try and apply the things that we shared today in terms of uh you know that whole wheel about how can i lovingly translate this as i relate to my child how can i effectively communicate how can i listen my love languages where can i work on my love languages so that i understand my child's love language start with that start with that 30 day goal and then as you start practicing that then you start taking on the next thing so when you start breaking it down it becomes a lot more easier but again it's not based on man's effort or human will but it's god he gives the grace because family is his design not yours and yes. mine yes so god is responsible so that's the motivation for us to seek transformation in every relationship that we have because if if it was up to you and me we would be failures all our lives <laughs> so please do not beat yourself up uh please be mindful that each of us is on a journey of learning and shaping so also our children and i hope some of the things that we shared today will help you as you go back if you do have any further questions feel free to you know um send that back to us and then we can try and help you on that i hope that helps you chris yeah i think the main thing is she she can't uh, talk because she has a baby uh, sleeping in her arms so but yeah i think it's the key is trusting god right we cannot go back and change our past uh, you know there are things that we ourselves are healing because of the consequences of choices we may have made in the past but god is a gracious god god is a good god right and i would say don't lean on your own understanding because when we see certain traits in our children we start attributing it to what we may have done what we may have said what may what me we may have not done but that is again leaning on our own understanding we're not trusting god right so when you're taking the step and saying okay now lord i'm going to walk with you i'm going to draw from you then you've got to trust god to to fill the gaps you know and and then you will see uh what you believe uh you know is is your child's uh you know god given destiny so um yeah he he is a restorer he is a rebuilder he is a renewer and he will do that just the way he would have done it for you and me he will do it for your child and specifics 
you know, specific wisdom for a specific situation. Maybe it is to do with, uh, say, separation or a divorce. Maybe it's to do with maybe child abuse, things like that. Very specific. God will give you specific wisdom for that situation, uh, specific prayers to pray, maybe, you know, uh, specific people to speak to so that the child can get healing or an understanding as they grow up. And those are things God will open doors and connect you with people or, or give you the wisdom to do it, uh, you know, the God way. So, you know, just to add to what Manoj already said, uh, you know, trust God, full stop. <laughs> and, and he will do it. Yeah. yeah? There's, there's one one thing that will possibly help us. Uh, you, know, you know, most of us are Christian. So it's a familiar scripture you've all possibly heard. Train a child mm -hmm. in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he shall not turn from it. Okay. Now, here's something that I want to share. We are called to train a child in the way that he should go. This is not God's way. This is not our way. The Bible says train a child in the way that he should go, which means find out the personality of your child and try and enhance that personality. Your job is to facilitate. Your job is to give direction, not to try and control your child. Train a child in the way that he or she should go according to their personality, according to their mental makeup, according to where they are in this period of their life. We all have children in different stages of life. So like an archer, when an archer has a bow, the archer knows exactly where the bend in the bow is, right? As parents, you need to find where the bend in your child is. That's how you train the child in the way that he should go. Then what is God's promise? When we find the bend, when we find where the child needs my support, emotional support and so on and so forth. When I find and when we find the bend in the child, that requires godly wisdom. So when you go to God and say, God, this is your design. Children are heritage from you. And when I find the bend in the child, then the Bible says, when he or she is old, they will not turn from it. The problem is many times we want to make children into our own image. And we need to start unlearning that. So this is where as parents, we need to start being open that I messed up, but God, today is a fresh day, new start. I ask for wisdom today. That's why I told Chris and all the other parents who may be feeling like, hey, I made a mess of this. You're not alone. And there's hope in Jesus. Yeah. I hope I hope that you know we can we can meditate on that and, and, and trust God to give you the grace for that. I think uh, Nikki, uh, you wanted to share something? Um yes, Lindsay. Um I, I mentioned before as well, right? I'm not a parent yet, uh, but I uh, in because of my profession, I deal with the uh, youth a lot, day in and day out. I deal with youth, and that's the reason I wanted to attend the session. So some way we I can, you know through God's will make some difference in their life. But as all the parents were talking, I got reminded of something that my mom did. As a 19 year old, when, you know, I uh, I was in a relationship, I didn't really know what, I feel funny talking about it now. So I was in a relationship and then I broke up and all that stuff. At that point in time, it felt like the end of, end of life. And at that point in time, it felt like I don't want anyone and all that stuff. But at that, you know, what my mom did not sh shout at me, though all my relatives came and said hundreds of things. She did not shout. She asked them to just leave the house. She did not do anything. Even my dad, all that she did was she came to me every single day, though I was rude to her. She came to me every single day with tea and biscuits and breakfast and lunch. And she said, she just said, it happens. Take time to heal. You have no questions to answer anyone. You did what your heart said, but now trust that I am with you. Take as much time as you want, heal, pray to God. And if you want anything, come to me, but don't take any wrong step. You want to do anything, come and ask me. I will, you want to go out, you want to go on a vacation, you want to do anything. You don't want to talk to anyone, do whatever you want, but tell me what you want. And she gave me that kind of space and she made me understand that, you know, no matter what, I understand you, what you did was right. You know, what you thought was right, but then uh, I don't blame you for it. Okay, she didn't shout, she didn't hit me or she didn't do all those drama which normally happens at home. Okay, it took me years to get out of it. But somehow, 
you know uh, i i was so much into it that i got into um, i i got into depression and i was admitted in the hospital and all even then she just came and told me i love you and what has happened has happened i want you to live for me i want you to you know i i love you a lot i want you to live for me and i want you to spend your life with me you want to get married or don't want to get married that's left up to you but as of now i want you for me please understand that and uh, you are everything for me and that i i remember it was uh, jan 20 jan 31st night and she said let's start a new year and uh, it it completely changed every time i think about that i feel like crying you know it completely changed my life and um, i was able, i was able to heal those words were like healing for my soul and um, after that also when i told her that i i love a guy after many years she never said you know what your love failed first she never said that she met the guy and she said whatever you want but the thing is you i i want to meet the guy i want to meet the family and i want i want to understand if you're going the right direction and the moment she met she was like yeah i'm fine with that so those words you know it really healed me had she had she taken that moment to scold me and to be little me i don't think i i would have had a relationship with her mm. so something i wanted to say yeah wow thanks thanks nikki yeah we can relate to the fact that we also started working with youth and teens way before we had children and i think it's a call for some of us and it really helps i think you know and 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 we can always go back to our parents some things they did right some things they didn't but i think the highlight of what nikki shared is that the only thing she could hear in all that cloudiness and pain and confusion from her mother was that her mother was there her mother loved her and if there was one person for which she needed to live uh, it was her and you know um that is amazing i think that's what we parents always need to keep in mind that our children know don't assume with children i think we a lot a lot of the times we assume that they know we're buying all these things i'm cooking meals what they like and you know we assume that they know but uh, you will be surprised if, if when you start having a heart to heart intentional conversation there will be things and questions that come out of their mouth that actually surprises you right so i think um, thanks so much nikki for sharing i'm sure it's helped Uh, many of us listening anyone else i think we have another 5 minutes to go a few more to share uh, thank you alinti and uh, pastor manoj so uh, every moment of it is uh, a take away for me so uh, just now when you said assume you know i just wanted to share my experience on assumptions so i always knew the importance of spending time with you know your child and all my daughter is so hardly 7 years old now but i always used to think that i'm spending time i give her bath feeding get, getting her homework done so i used to think oh my whole day goes around her plus my work so one of the day when she said you don't have time for me i was like what a slap on my face what whole day i'm just thinking about you uh, and you know getting your work done so i always used to think that i'm spending time and then i realized ah so at that moment you know i start it took me some time to understand where i'm going wrong and then i realized it it should be about her uh, what she wants to do it is her time to speak or to play so now so we started you know tagging that time as mama mabel time so mm. she looks forward to like mama mabel time so i give her a chance to choose today what do you want to do in mama mabel time so she's like excited to you know Uh, think about it you know and to work about it so sometimes i still fail to give her you know every day but yes uh, so that assumption when you said it it's so true that we i i also assumed and somewhere we had to be sorry in front of them and said no okay let let have your way and because it's your time so that was one of the you know so when pastor said giving time and communication i could so much relate and thank you for reiterating children spell love not as l o v e yeah they spell it t i m e yeah thanks thanks marina so, for sharing yeah, so good so good anyone else i saw uh, milo coming to unmute but i think <laughs> yeah it's uh... it's so nice uh, to uh, attend this uh, workshop uh, i totally agree with uh, one thing which you shared is uh, the the words we use with our children i think bible also very very, very says uh, 
we should be very careful with our tongue. Mm. Uh, in the world, uh, you know, they use that uh, word very so casually, even a slang language, uh, it's very normal for them. Yes. Well, I just wanted to share, you know, how uh, a word uh, spoken to a immature child, sometimes they carry in their life. Mm. Uh, little which I had is uh, in my life, uh, my mother uh, is uh, very one of the my best mother who really, I mean, uh, really uh, brought me. But one word which affected a uh, little bit was she did not tell with the wrong intention. Uh, she loves me, but uh, you know, uh, between the siblings, sometimes you compare. <laughs> mm. My younger sister was more smarter than me. <laughs> she very outgoing and uh, uh, more outgoing and of course, a very good speaker also, oratory mm. and all, like she was more outgoing. So I remember, you know, not with the wrong intention, my mother, mm. oh, uh, he was, uh, casually I remember she told once, uh, oh, probably uh, my sister is, more like a male, I could have been uh, the sister, he could have been the brother. <laughs> that was very casually, he, he told, uh, I remember in the childhood, with, not with the wrong intention, mm. but that's just his observation. Mm. But uh, sometimes it uh, stick with me in the school that uh, I think I am not smart. <laughs> mm. That uh, thing little remain with me. Mm. I think I I am not smart. I mean, I I I was a little underestimation and also slightly negative effect. Mm. Of course, that did not affect me. I overcome that. But I what I wanted to share is what I agree with you. Sometimes the words we release uh, sometimes unintentionally. It may also. I think I think we should be quite sensitive. <laughs> or mm. uh, the word uh, sometimes. Uh, words which will not build others certain mm -hmm. slang language like that. Yes. Sometimes the immature child, you know, they carry those uh, seeds a uh, long time. Some maybe get affected, some overcome that. Yes. So this is uh, one thing which I agree with you really. I read and learned many things. Great, great. Malo, if, if we may ask you to share, what do you do now? Uh, <laughs> Myself, uh, uh, I am faculty in the Department of Forensic Medicine, uh, AIMS Delhi. Okay, so you, you definitely turned out much better than what you thought. And <laughs> God is a good, good God, right? So let me repeat that if I got that. You said you are a faculty in the Forensic Department of AIMS in New Delhi. Right. And I'm sure you need to be extremely smart to be faculty in aims <laughs> so god is god is definitely a good god for those of us who think that you know, we've, we've not done very well god always restores uh, in a manner that you and i you know can't even imagine so thank you so much thank you so much Praise for sharing anyone else maybe we can have one more person um, share and feel free to even put it on the chat if there's anything that you'd like us to uh, you know take up in the coming weeks um, uh, or anything, any questions, keep putting it in the chat or you can even message, um, you know, on, on, on the group and we can address it. But one last comment and then we can close in prayer. We want to really keep time. Uh, we do respect uh, all of you taking the time out. So maybe one last comment. Um, I would like to thank Pastor Manoj and uh, Lindsay for this actually very fruitful session actually. Even though we know most of these things, uh, we, we, we as parents, we know that we know everything. But many times we do uh, realize that some somewhere we lack actually. So my just um, like everything was a takeaway actually. But then one thing which I would want you to just say, like, like these affirming words when we say, for mm -hmm. our teenagers, it is more about, you know, peer pressures and they value what their peers say. Like, even mm -hmm. if, you know, we try to give them affirming assurances and we keep encouraging them, but for them, what their friends say is, you know, 
they take it more valuable they they consider that you know because they want to have an impression that they are at par with them so sometimes we fail in that you know area of giving that affirming though we would try our best to do that but sometimes you know these affirming words are not enough for our teenagers you know because they have that challenge because uh, we, i i do face that with my daughter she is a 14 year old uh, time but uh, you know the kind of friends that they have you can't stop having them do, uh, you know having them that kind of a friendship but then uh, for them what the friends say is more important or more valuable so sometimes she come ma'am ma- uh, like mummy you don't understand you know this is what my friends think you don't understand so yeah. uh, just your like how we can uh, you know uh, how we can uh, um, like i i don't know how to do that so if you can just <laughs> just uh, you know give your inputs on that it would be really helpful but overall it was really helpful uh, to understand all these love languages we do follow most of the time most yeah. often but these affirming words is where i struggle uh, you know giving you know my daughter right right um i mean just in in a in just in just so that we can keep time in a quick uh, nutshell i think what like what we said some things you don't see the result immediately and i think teenage years is one time when they seem to take the or value the uh, what their friends say more than what we say or value what the social media says more than what we say it seems like that but be rest assured that what you do because the authority that you have is not something that they have a choice god has given you that authority right so what you say has an effect so it's it's almost like we have to walk by faith and not by sight i say that to myself many times in a day especially when it comes to parenting um so just be rest assured so you you won't always see you know you what do we want to see as parents them saying oh mama that's so great you know so even if my child uh, you know my friend said that I, at least you think i'm beautiful at least you think i'm you know intelligent they won't respond like that right they won't say it but when they come and say oh, when they crib or when they whine or when they're upset about something that the friend said you make sure that you reassure them right you make sure that you speak words of affirmation towards them and uh, you know also when we pray we pray over them right what we said in the beginning keep the end in mind partner with god in what god is doing in their lives right so you can keep the end in mind and keep speaking that over them right so uh, yeah i i totally agree and i think um, we see that a lot where you know uh, children do take friends comments more than the parents but that's actually not true right how they respond yes you think that they don't value you at all so you start saying okay i'm not going to say anything forget it anyway they don't value it don't do that right you may need to change ways in which you do things god will give you the wisdom but don't don't withdraw thinking that it's not important right i'm just going to read um, what rekha has shared here uh, one of the things i started doing after my daughter started exhibiting stubbornness and rebellion and when all my efforts didn't seem to be yielding results was to start praying over them while they were still asleep in the morning just started it recently but i'm seeing a definite difference there are still bouts of rebellion but they are fewer and farther apart the other thing that i have started doing is to get into bed and cuddle with each of my daughters for about 5 minutes before waking them up just trying to show them that i love them no matter what particularly helps after arguments when typically kiddo will push us away and not hug us for the night as we usually do thanks so much rekha for for sharing that um yeah i think that's all in terms of the sharing i think she just wanted to share that um i think that's it um I, as i said we wanted to keep time so we'll just quickly close in prayer if you still have any questions thoughts comments um you can put it in the chat box or please message uh, on the group or you have our numbers on that group if you want to do it separately we can do that as well uh, in the coming weeks we will be uh, making ourselves available for those of you who want to meet on a one on one and pray together or maybe there is a specific um situation that you want counseling or just help with you know uh, we will be available we will mention how we can do that how we can schedule that in the coming weeks um uh, but apart from that that's it for today that's a lot 
for one evening. Hope you can mull over that, process it with the Holy Spirit and uh, hope to see you all next week. But before we say bye, I'm going to ask Manoj to just close in prayer and then we will say bye. Okay. Okay, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this uh, evening time and Father, I pray with full confidence that the seeds that have been sown, you are faithful to preserve. Yes. And I pray that over every parent. Lord, I also want to just declare the release of the fathers into the home. Yes, God. Those who are proxy, those who are absent, those who are not actively involved in the lives of their children and their family. Today, Lord, we agree and we just declare the release of the grace of fatherhood in the home. Father, I want to thank you that you are faithful to watch over each home and each family. And until we meet again, may your grace enable each one of us to journey with you, to be open and honest about changes that we need to bring about in our own lives. Lord, give us an open mind and open heart. And the Holy Spirit, I ask that you will search out things in us that have impacted not just us, but our children's lives and help mm -hmm. us to bring correction to those areas. Help us to be, uh, Lord, intentional because when you give grace, you also give us the will to be able to do it. Yes. So I speak that over every home, every parent, every child. Uh, I just want to thank you for this evening time. We commit this night to you. And uh, through this night, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and visit us in our dreams, uh, Lord, in our thoughts, in our meditations. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for taking this big step of investing in what God has given you. And hope to see you all next week. So till then, keep mulling over things we did today. So thank you. Happy parenting. We want to hear some good reports next Saturday. We did this, you know, with the children. So it'll be great to hear. Thank you so much. Good night. Good, night. good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon to those of you joining from different parts of the world um, and also India. Thank you. Bye-bye.